I'm very pleased to be here tonight, and I really appreciate you all coming to hear us. Thank you very much. I want to talk to you about my nation, the Teltans. This is our traditional territory, and I want to tell you the story of how we moved from abject poverty to affluence. 98% unemployment is zero. That traditional territory of ours, you heard Naileen speak a little bit about it, is 150,000 square kilometers or 97,500 square miles. It's about the size of France. And as she mentioned, we have an awful lot of resources in there. And uh, I'm going to tell you our story. This is my fish camp. It's a confluence of the Stikine and the Teltan River. That road you can see is, has some of the steepest grades of any public road in Canada. In 1983-84, we had 98% unemployment in the winter. We had 65% unemployment in the summer. We had 80% of our members were on welfare. We had a serious alcohol and drug problem. We had high suicide rates. One year we had as many as five. We had very low education standards. If we were lucky, we probably had one or two graduates to high school. By 2006, we had 95% employment in the winter, 100% in the summer. We trained over 21 journeyman carpenters in five years, six welders, three heavy-duty mechanics, dozens of heavy equipment operators and truck drivers, three chefs, a lot of kitchen trainees and workers, office staff, office managers, camp managers, and between 98, 1998 and 2006, we introduced alcohol and drug programs. Our suicide rates dropped to zero, and we had very few people on welfare. In fact, when I was the chief in 2005, 2006, um, it was probably one of the first times that the Teltan Band had ever had to return welfare money back to the federal government, to the Department of Indian Affairs, because we couldn't spend it. And believe me, I hate giving money back to the government. <laughs> <clears throat> so your question is, of course, the $64 question is, how did we do it? Well, it was very simple. We had a methodology. First, we had a vision. Then we needed a strategy. And then we needed a vehicle to take that strategy to fruition. So our vision was very simple. Eliminate unemployment in the Teltan Nation within 20 years. Simple vision. Our strategy was also very simple. We didn't want to work with the Department of Indian Affairs jobs and training style of, of operations because we knew that wouldn't work. We need to look for a nation building model. And when I talk about the Indian Affairs programs, a lot of times we, they look to what we call gas stations and stores or mom and pop businesses. They're great for families. They're great for some, a family to own a business like that and make a living, but it, it's not going to change your nation. And one of the things that happened to us is we lost our bush economy. The bush economy is no more for us. The environmentalists killed our crop in our way of life. So we had to look to the wage economy. I was a little bit younger in those days and I had more hair. Our vehicle was also pretty simple. We did the Teltan Nation Development Corporation. And I'll tell you how the Teltan Nation Development Corporation came into being. In January 1965, I, sorry, 1985, in, Chief Ivan Kwok had negotiated with Indian Affairs to build the first 10 modern homes in Telegraph Creek. He did that in the fall of 84. 85, he came to Whitehorse. I was working for the Council for Yukon Indians as a business service officer, and he came there along with Pat Zertza, who was the chief of the Isca Teltans, and Vernon Marion, who was the president of the Teltan Tribal Council. And because they came to meet with the Council for Yukon Indians, I was there, and of course, some of them are my, my relatives, and he's the chief, so naturally I met with them. And I asked what was happening at home. 
And he said, well, we're going to build the first 10 modern homes in Telegraph Creek. And out of the blue, I said to him, who's your contractor? And he said, we don't have one. I said, why don't we build those houses ourselves? Why don't we just start a company and build them ourselves? So this is about four in the afternoon, and he went, home, went down to the hotel. And I got a call about seven o'clock, eight o'clock that night. And he said, Jerry, I want you to come down to the Yukon Inn tomorrow morning at seven o'clock to have breakfast and talk about this corporation. Well, I don't know about today, but back in 85, when the chief says he wants to talk to you at seven o'clock in the morning, you'd be there at seven o'clock in the morning. But at least he bought me breakfast. So I want to show you why he was so adamant about these new houses. In 1965, these were the houses they built for our people in Telegraph Creek. Between 1970 and 1980, they got a little better. They were two bedroom, but they didn't have power and they didn't have running water. That electricity was added later. Then between 80 and 84, they built what we called clapboard houses, two by four construction, one stove in the living room. We get 40 to 60 below weather. So in the bedroom where the kids usually slept, it was frost on the walls, very unhealthy situation. So we talked about building these houses ourselves. And so that's where we developed the Teltan Nation Development Corporation. When he asked if I could put this company together off the side of my desk while I was working for the Council for Yukon Indians, I said yes. So I put the thing together. I went down and I met with the two band councils and the Central Council of Teltan Tribal Council representatives in Dees Lake on August or sorry, on April the 5th. I know the date very well because that's my oldest daughter's birthday. And we talked about it, and I gave it the name, the Teltan Tribal Development Corporation. And the leadership balked immediately and said, we're not a tribe, we're a nation. And that's how the Teltan Nation Development Corporation was born. So the next year, Chief Pat Zertza negotiated with Indian Affairs and CMHC to build 50 houses over five years. So this gave us a real opportunity to put in training programs from everything from heavy equipment operators, carpenters, jip rockers, you name it, anything to build a house. So we were allowed to put in some serious, serious training programs. So over the time, we built 30 houses in Telegraph Creek. We built the band office. We built the fire hall. We enlarged the store. We built the new health center for ourselves. That's Lorgan Bob, one of our counselors, doing the grand opening when I was the chief. We built the complex in Dees Lake. We built eight houses for Head Lake Housing Society. We built 10 houses on reserve. We built the health center for Health Canada, the Stickeen Health Center. We built 50 homes in Iskut. We built their band office as well. So again, as I mentioned, our building strategy was, of course, not to depend on the Department of Indian Affairs. So we knew we had to look off the reserve for solutions. There's no way the economy of the Telta or any reserve can sustain you, at least in our nation. So we had to look off reserve. So we looked to the forestry, mining, and hydro development to do that. But before we did it, when you hear Naylene talk about threat, we also had to have a policy in place. It was called the Teltan Resource Development Policy. That came into effect in April 1987 before I negotiated the first deal. But one thing this resource development policy did was give me a box, a framework that I could negotiate in. Anything outside of that box had to be dealt with by leadership. So it was a very simple policy, only eight points. And the first point, of course, was the development shall not pose an irreparable environmental damage. Number two, it did not jeopardize or prejudice the outstanding Aboriginal rights claims of the Teltan people. Number three, had to have more positive than negative impacts on the Teltan people. Four, provide for education and direct employment-related training for Teltan people. Five, 
the widest employment opportunity for Teltan people. And six, this is very important. We wanted equity participation for Teltans in these projects, and I'm going to talk more about that later. Seven, had to have the widest possible opportunities for Teltan businesses. And eight, of course, to help the Teltans accomplish the above noted objectives. So it was pretty simple for me to negotiate because I had a box. And anything outside of that box had to be dealt with by leadership. So our first project we negotiated on was the Golden Bear Mine. And the Golden Bear Mine happened in, in March of 1988. The Teltan Golden Bear Agreement was the first native participation agreement in British Columbia. It was the fourth in all of Canada and was mainly a socioeconomic agreement, but it did have contracting opportunities. So one of the things that when I negotiated, I figured out that we needed a minimum of $3 million worth of equipment to become a heavy equipment division and to be a force to be reckoned with. So I negotiated with the Native Economic Development Program and I received $1.8 million grant. I borrowed $1.2 million from the equipment dealers and then I negotiated a three-year upgrade and maintenance contract on this 160-kilometer road so I could pay for this equipment. But one of the things about being Native people back in 1988 was that the developers thought Natives can only do fancy beadwork and carve totem poles. Well, it's true, our women can do fancy beadwork. But Teltans never did carve totem poles. If we wanted them, we bought them from our Clinkin neighbors. <laughs> they made beautiful poles. So one of the things that you hear very quickly when I was doing this was, where's your track record? Record, Show us what you've done. Well, of course, we hadn't been in business yet, but we did have a lot of equipment. We had a lot of trained people. So we went to joint venturing. We joint ventured with a company called Grant Stewart Construction. Teltans had worked for him. That's him and his son were there. And so the Teltans knew them. So we signed a joint venture. And we negotiated the first contract, which was a settling pond contract for the Golden Bear Mine. And then we negotiated a five-year open pit mining agreement. And then we built the road. We had to rebuild most of that 100-mile road. We did a lot of the site work. We helped build the mill. We did about 40% of the mill because they needed cranes and whatnot, and we weren't interested in buying a crane, so we brought in a company that had them, and we joint ventured with them to do the job. But by 1991, the Teltan Nation Development Corporation was the largest native-owned and operated heavy construction company in Western Canada. But like I said, it was a socioeconomic agreement, and in that agreement, the one clause said we had the right to 20% employment. When we finished that contract, we had 39% of the workforce. We had 75% of all the employment for any contractors that came on site. And one of the things that we're very proud of is the fact that in most mines in Canada, the turnover was average, averaging 20 to 24% a year. Our turnover was 2 to 4%. So just to show you that we are very serious about the environment, when they wanted to put the road into the Golden Bear Mine, they wanted to go through what's called the Shesley Valley. And the Teltans were adamantly opposed to that. So they came to us and said, why are you so opposed? Well, the Shesley Valley is one of the only Class A winter moose habitat areas in British Columbia. It's a primary spawning area for salmon and has one of the largest concentration of inland grizzlies in British Columbia. So we didn't want hunters going in there to slaughter our moose in the winter or the grizzlies because they're so easy to kill because they're just there fishing salmon. So we were adamantly opposed. So we, they said that there's the only route we have. I said, that's nonsense. So it comes back to this traditional ecological knowledge. I took my great uncle Felix out there, he was 83 at the time, along with Vernon Marion, who was our superintendent and understood construction, along with our engineer and a helicopter, and in three days, 
we proposed three more routes for them. And so when you talk about traditional ecological knowledge, we proved to them that wasn't the only way into that mine. And so for that, we received the BC Environmental Award from 1989 for rerouting that road. The Teltan Central Council and Teltan Nation Development Corporation. So our next project was the Big SK Mine. And that project, between 1990 and 2008, we built a 68-kilometer road, we constructed the camp, we did the site work, we constructed the mill, we did all the earthworks, we negotiated a long-term road maintenance contract for that 68 kilometers of road, we negotiated with Aero Transport, we did a joint venture called Aero Teltan for doing all the ore haul and all of the hauling into the mine, we started Spatsizi Remote Services. Spatsizi is Teltan for red goat, because we have a mountain in our country that has red mud and the goats roll in it, and so they're red. So we call it the Red Goat Remote Services, which is our catering, housekeeping, and security company. We had 42% of the employment at that mine, and between 1990 and 2008, we did over $200 million in contracts with Homestake and Barrick. Galore Creek was the next project. And you see the roof on these buildings, they're what's called a 612 pitch, because there's nothing to snow five feet in one night there. And unfortunately, that program, it only lasted between 2006 and 2008, but the Teltans had negotiated $176 million in contracts just for that mine. Individual Teltans, had negotiated over $30 million in contracts as well. But due for economic reasons, that project was shut down in 2008. So those contracts didn't come to fruition. We mentioned hydro projects. I negotiated the first independent hydro project owned by Aboriginal people in British Columbia. And uh, it was a three megawatt project to take Dees Lake off of diesel generation. So we negotiated a 20-year power purchase agreement with BC Hydro. We sold them two megawatts of power. We still had one, power, one megawatt left. But because of the flow of water, we have the capacity to generate six megawatts. So if the transmission line ever reaches Dees Lake, all we have to do is add another turbine and we add another three megawatts of power. Our next big project was the Alta Gas. That 1.2 is correct, it is $1.2 billion. The Forest Kerr intake tunnel is 25 meters or, eight, or 80 feet high, 3.2 kilometers long. We joint ventured that with uh, Procon Mining. There's three projects they have, the Forest Kerr, which is 198 megawatt, McClymont, which is 68 megawatt, and the Volcano Creek, which is 38 megawatt. And I'm going to tell you more about our investments in a second. That agreement was signed in 2013. And with the BC government, they have what's called the Clean Energy Act. And because the Teltans haven't signed a land claims agreement, they had to negotiate rents for land and water with us. And because they gave all the gas a 60-year agreement, we demanded a 60-year agreement as well. So our share is two and a half million a year for 60 years, but with our escalation clause built in it to it, we could reach almost a half a billion dollars. And we still had McClymont and Volcano to negotiate. So we received the first check from them, and it was for five on, on December the 12th, 2014, and it was for a half a million dollars. But one of our agreements was in this with all the gas was we had the right to invest our monies back into their project. And so we chose to invest into the Volcano Creek project. Now I'm sure people are here who understand finances very well. Our agreement was for 7.95% interest for 60 years. Today you're lucky to get 2%, 1%, but we want 7.95%. It didn't take them very long to figure out how much money they're going to have to pay us. So 
So after we put the first half a million dollars into their hands, we never spent a nickel. We just said, here, we want to invest it now. They came to an agreement with us, and they said, we'll sell you 50% of the Volcano Creek project for another $2 million. It probably cost them 7 or $8 million to build that project. We bought 50% for $2.5 million. And we still have other considerations I'll tell you about later. Nalene mentioned the transmission line. We did most of the clearing and, and upgrading through our traditional territory. We didn't build the transmission line, but we did a lot of the service work on it. The last mine we worked on and we're still working on today is the Red Chris mine. And uh, we have what's called revenue sharing. We negotiated an agreement with the BC government because they are going to share some of the taxes with Aboriginal people. Well, we negotiated, I negotiated the first agreement for the upper and lower Similka mine on, on a project down in their country for 38% of the taxes. And so that's what the Teltans demanded, and that's what we received, 38% of the taxes from those projects. This year, 2017, that amounted to $2.9 million, almost $3 million. And just to show you how the Teltans spend their money, uh, or sorry, where the money came from, it came from Forest Kerr, the $2.1 million, Volcano was 69000 322,000 from McClymont and 368,000 from Red Chris. So that's where our revenue sharing came from. And this is how we distributed it. Teltan Central Government got 500, just about 600,000. Each community got around 450,000. Our language program got almost 300,000. Wildlife, almost 150. Legal, 300 and Neller's Fund of almost 300000 So that's how we distributed those tax dollars. We signed a contract, a new agreement with the Bruce Jack Mine. It's a 21-year agreement. They gave us a $210,000 signing bonus, so we divided among the communities, and the central government received it. But that agreement is for 21 years, and I'm told that it's potentially $7 million a year for the next 21 years. So what did we do with the money? This money here is a different money because it goes into the Teltan Heritage Trust. We received 1.5 million from Forest Kerr, 80 from Volcano, 330 from McClymont, 350 from Red Chris, and Galore Creek, even though that mine is shut down, still has to pay us 300,000 a year for rental. So that two and a half million dollars goes into our, our Teltan Trust Fund. So the revenue this year we received was $5.7 million. Our Heritage Trust received $2.5 million, and now we have just over $12 million in our trust fund. So I want to tell you about where TNDC, the Teltan Nation Development Corporation, is today. I love that logo. We have two clans, the wolf and the crow. I'm from the wolf clan. This is our building, that a new office shop complex. We opened June 30th, 2016. It's worth $5.3 million. Uh, it's built right over top of that building. Back in the day, I built that building for $300,000, and now this one is worth 5.3, over 5 million more. It's worth 5 million more than the first building we built. So this year we didn't have a very great year. We just made around $9 million in revenue, but we paid $2 million in wages. 85% of the employees are Teltans, and 94% of all the employees are First Nation. We have eight divisions. We have 27 joint ventures. We have aviation, construction and power line. We have communication and IT. We're putting the micro... Microfiber line from Terrace up to Dees Lake you know, along the transmission corridor. We have an environmental division. We have camp services and exploration. We have transportation and fuel, drilling and blasting, and engineering. And we own $11.5 million worth of equipment. And 
And we also have our, our environmental company. This is a joint venture between ResCan. ResCan is sold now, but we still keep the name ResCan Telton Environmental Consulting. And I love this logo. It's, to me, it's our best logo with the wolf and the crow. It has the river, the stikin, the green for the forest and the mountains. But embossed on that logo are the words keepers of the land. And I want you to know what Nalene talked about is right. These are not just fancy words that we throw out. Teltans actually believe we're keepers of the land. We have a joint venture. We own 49% of Pacific Western helicopters. We own 51% of the Northwalk drilling. And our investments I talked about, the Imperial Metals offered a $30 million debenture. We bought 1.6 million of that debenture. We have a 6% per annum paid, paid semi-annually to us, matures in 2021. And also, in 2015, 30 years after our incorporation, Teltan Nation Development Corporation received the BC Aboriginal Community Business Award of the Year. And so what I tell people is this. If the Teltan Nation can take our, our little nation of abject poverty from 98% unemployment to zero, any Aboriginal community can do it. All you need is a vision, strategy, and a vehicle. But I want to tell you now about where the Teltans are today. I'm not sure if some of you here have heard about the big forest fires in British Columbia last summer. Well, one of those forest fires went through the Teltan Nation, in fact, four of them. August the 1st, a dry lightning storm went through the Teltan country, started one fire west, two fires to the north, and one fire to the south of Telegraph Creek. On by August 4th, the west fire and the two north fires joined up, became a 100,000 hectare fire. We were forced to evacuate Telegraph Creek, and on August the 5th, the fire went through our community. That was the last picture taken, leaving Telegraph Creek the night of the 5th. So we lost 27 structures on our reserve. 21 member homes. We lost the two nurses' residences. We lost our big social health and social services building. We lost the Catholic Church and their residence. We lost six other homes and about another 20 out buildings and vehicles outside of Telegraph Creek. And uh, there was some damage done to our store, the community center, and the RCMP buildings. Two weeks ago, the minister, Jean Philpotts, came and visited our community, and she gave an interview to CBC, and this is what she said. Telton Nation itself incurred the worst structural damage of any First Nation community in recorded Canadian history. So moving forward, where do we go? Well, I can tell you the Teltans are not sitting on their hands. We already have a new vision, bigger and better. But when we talk, Teltan talk, we don't talk the community of Telegraph Creek. We talk about the whole nation. So we talk about Iskut, Deese Lake, as well as Telegraph Creek. So the vision, pretty simple, bigger and better. Bigger is nothing to us, okay? We can build anything we want. We can build any administration building. We can build these houses. That's not a problem. Problem is the word better. We haven't quite wrapped our head around what better means yet or what better looks like. So we're going to be talking to a lot of people because there's a whole bunch of words being thrown around already by the people of the Teltan Nation. And you're hearing words like green, renewable, new technology, sustainable community. So we're going to be talking to people and getting ideas over the next six to eight months because the next building season starts probably in May and June. So we're going to be wanting ideas from people who have ideas about what sustainable and new technology will do to help us. We're definitely interested if somebody wants to be a, do a pilot project. Teltans are great guinea pigs. 
We think we can do that with no problem. But you know, there's one thing, ladies and gentlemen, I have absolute faith in. Is that like the Phoenix? Telegraph Creek, the Teltan people and the Teltan nation are going to rise from those ashes bigger, better, and stronger. Madhu.